Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you, God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back into our Father's Word. Real proud, proud of my flower today. A little Iowa flower brought this flower down to me, and I'm really proud of it, okay? I'll just get that right off the top so we all understand. What a fantastic day that we can study the minor prophets. It's tomorrow's newspaper letting us know and, and giving us the ability to discern the events whereby we know what's about to transpire. So we want to remember that Micah means who is like God? Who is like Yahweh? Well, no one is. It's one of the only titles in the Word of God that is actually a question, Micah. And remember that the first three chapters of Micah are threatenings. God's not happy with the way his children and all the people of the world are doing overall. And you'll remember in chapter 1, verse 2, it addresses all the earth and all therein. So that means all of his children, regardless of whether it's Israel, Judah, or of the ethnic uh, peoples. Doesn't matter. He's not happy. And he lets us understand why uh, that he is unhappy and primarily it's because people listen to traditions of men. They are not aware, uh, quite frankly, I'll just be honest up front and say the Kenite that plans day and night how to rip off the farm community, try to take his land, price fixing, uh, inflation, controlling markets, and they don't quite wake up. So these people stay awake all night long, dreaming up how when morning comes, how to rip people off. And he expects his children to be sharp enough that uh, you are rip-off proof, meaning if you're inoculated with God's Word, you're not going to get ripped off. You can spot them 10 miles away. You're not an easy mark. And if anything, you'll give them a lesson rather than they giving you a lesson. So that, that kind of disappoints our Father especially when you begin then to pick up their religious beliefs. Christianity is not a religion, it's a reality. And your father expects you to know that and live it, all right? Though we all fall short, though we all um, mess up at times. He paid the price for forgiveness where we can get started again. So <clears throat> he had just made the statement that I recapped there. So with that having been said, chapter 2, a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name. Let's pick it up in verse 4. Let's go with it. It reads, In that day shall one take up a parable against you and lament with a doleful lamentation and say, We be utterly spoiled. We have changed, and this means for the worse, the portion of my people. How hath he removed it from me? Turning away, he hath divided our fields. He ripped them off till he ended up with the fields. So I thank God for the American farmer that's, that's uh, still out there, uh, I mean, hoofing it, uh, making it with, under the conditions that they have to make it under today. Fantastic. Uh, as he would say back in, um, in the uh, second verse, so they oppress a man and his house, even a man in his heritage. In other words, they try to take their homes away from him. Well, make sure that doesn't happen. And the way you do that is you stay out of usury to, uh, to the heavy extent. Use good judgment. Okay, enough said. Okay, he said this, they're just going to actually take up a parable. They're, they're going to create a saying about this. Verse 5. Therefore... Thou shalt have none that shall cast a cord by lot in the congregation of the Lord. This really says a great deal in the Hebrew because when a new area came along, there was usually done by the priest that the, the land 
and the area was allotted and they cast lots. It simply meant it was, that's where our word a city lot comes from. It was measured and each family received a certain um, portion. And what it's saying here, there's a time coming when uh, my people camp, they're not going to cast the lot and say, this is yours. Well, that basically has come to pass because it's very difficult for young people, especially in this generation, to ever gain enough uh, finances to uh, begin an operation of fields. But tough ones can, and thank God we got some tough ones out there. They get it done. But God is saying, I'm not going to allow one of my priests to do it. He, they're not going to be there. Okay, why? They wouldn't listen to the priest. That is to say God's messengers. Verse 6. Uh, and it reads, Prophesy ye not, say they to them that prophesy. They shall not prophesy to them. They that, uh, that they shall not take shame. Now, this is a little bit confused. First of all, this is not the word normally uh, translated uh, or used uh, for the word prophecy or to prophesy. Um, it, um, it is uh, native, and it means to, uh, to ooze, to, to uh, distill. That means to just barely come out, to drip. Well, picture, if you would, an over a, a real ripe fig with a little drop of the sweetness and kind of what he's saying is the the word then becomes to chatter when you add the the rest of the sentence to the prophecy to chatter or to sputter and, and who's the subject these people that lay a bed in bed all night trying to rip the people off he said uh, they they don't don't sputter to us You've got a lot of sputters around. What is a sputter? What is one of those that ooze out? It's just so sweet, it just really bewailed you, but it moves so slow, you're never quite going to catch up. That there, the, the word ooze, meaning a false prophet, rather than just, thus saith the Lord. Just ooze a little bit of the truth out, about like a one-verse reverend, all right? And it would take you... Um, 300 years to study through the Bible, listening to them preach because they only do one verse at a time of what the Father has to say. So here we got a bunch of sputters. And what it's saying is, though, however, they that do listen to the true prophet will pull away from the shame because they won't know shame unless somebody teaches the real truth. They won't know, they'll be so ignorant N not being aware of the Father's anger and threatenings, as we're covering now, to realize they're doing something wrong, okay? So that's a very difficult uh, verse, but there is a great deal in it, and many scholars shake their head at it. Well, you don't have to. All it means, basically, and I'll recap real quickly, uh, sputter, don't sputter to us with that sputter talk. That's what the rip-off artist would say. But... Um, and, and they won't. But if someone doesn't, it states, they won't even know when to be ashamed. Verse 7, it'll fall in place for you. Listen carefully. 7, O thou that art named or called the house of Jacob. That's the Israelites. Is the spirit of the Lord straighted? Is it shortened? Is he handicapped? Do you think his words won't straighten you out? I'll, I'll translate it in real modern English. Are these his doings? Question. Do not my work, words do good to him that walketh uprightly? You bet they do. If you listen to God's word, and if you walk the best you can in it, even though you fall short, your father will bring blessings upon you and your family. There is no, even, let the sputter sputter. Let the sweet nectar of lies uh, that ooze forth in sugar sweetness. You don't have to worry. Just listen to me. You don't even have to understand the book of Revelations because you'll be gone anyway, they'll say. Sputter, sputter. Lying to people. 
Anytime some man tells you that he is more intelligent than God, meaning God wrote this letter, the entire letter, to you, and anytime some man stands between you and God saying you don't have to read God's letter, then you should know you're listening to a fool. If not, then he's talking to a fool anyway. Verse 8, even of late, my people is risen up as an enemy. And that's kind of sad, isn't it? When your own kin turn on you as an enemy, you pull off the robe with the garment from them that pass by securely as men averse from war. In other words, you practice highway robbery. And if someone does try to do right, you try to rip them off. Well, there's just one thing about it. When a man, woman, or child walks in the light of the Lamb, in the way of Yahweh, on his way, his path, um, the rip-off artist has got to get up pretty early to even keep up, much less rip off or practice any highway robbery, all right? But what it says, they, they have no conscience about ripping the very coat off your back. Verse 9. The women of my people have you cast out from their pleasant houses. That's their homes. From their children have you taken away my glory forever. What is, what is God's glory? His, the birthright, the heritage that God, the covenant that he made to his children. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. It's been ripped off, taken away. Very few people even know who they are today or what this, how this word applies to them. Many would say, well, you're back in the Old Testament again. You bet. Because it was written to that house that went over the Caucasus Mountains, those ten tribes, as well as many others, all people, that later would call themselves uh, various nations, tribes, but they're Caucasians. Basically, the Christian nations make up those ten tribes. They've lost it. God didn't lose them. He knows that, I'm sorry, his children have lost that touch, the glory of the birthright and that that comes with it. He brought forth salvation because he's a loving God. Verse 10, arise ye and depart, for this is not your rest. And that word is not Sabbath, which Sabbath means rest. Because it is polluted, it shall destroy you, even with a sore destruction. In other words, Christ is our true rest. Do not let the Antichrist become your rest. That possessor that he promised he would send in chapter 1, who would be the false Messiah. See that the sputtering of the false preachers does not lead you or lull you into a sleep especially prevent you from having a diligent study, a sincere study in the Word of God, whereby you can make your own mind up as to your Father's thoughts and His love for you. Verse 11, If a man, ish in the Hebrew, walking in the Spirit, that's to say wind, all right? I'll let you judge what kind of wind or spirit, and falsehood do lie. In other words, he's a false sputtering preacher. All right, you got it? I'll just say it real clear. Saying, I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink. He shall even be the prophet of this people. Those sputters will end up being your preachers. That's what he says, all right? Now, um... If a man walks in a falsehood, what's a falsehood? Anything that is contrary to God's word. It's why many of the teachers, the disciples and apostles would say more than one time that traditions of men make void the word of God. If you listen to sputters, even if it is passing out the wine, that sometimes it may end up being strong drink. Uh, relate it to strong delusion, if you would. Uh, actually, it says wine is yayan, yes. What is strong drink then? It is uh, sakur, sakur, kind of like we get our word liquor, all right? Well, but 
But understand this, saw Kerr, if you um, participate in it, then you become saw Kerr. Saw Kerr means intoxicated. It means, just to put it mildly, drunk. All right, drunk again. All right. So I don't care what you drink. It is not the substance itself that... Um, that becomes a strong drink. It's how much of it you drink. Do you understand? You could take the mildest substance in the world and con consume a gallon of it, and most likely uh, you'd be drunk. I'm a three, two beer or uh, a nice dinner of wine or whatever. Uh, anytime you drink a gallon of it, that it automatically becomes strong drink. What he's saying is the sputters, and incidentally, the word prophecy here is is the same. Uh, nap napped off as it was back in the other verse. Very unusual to be used, usually meaning false prophet, a sputterer, an oozer that just oozes enough sweetness to say, it'll be all right. You're going to be okay. Just know and you're going to fly away. Well, there's just one problem. God teaches against fly away. God teaches in, in uh, Ezekiel chapter six, uh, 13 that he dislikes and is very much against those that teach his people to fly to save their souls. And again, he stipulates in Mark 13 and Matthew 24 that the spurious Messiah definitely comes first. And there'll be two out in the field and one of them's going to fly away. Who to? Satan. That's the subject. And there are many people today that say, I would be the first taken of that field. Well, don't be stupid. The first one's taken by Antichrist. Go back and read it as a child would and pick up on the subject and the object. And I don't think you'll have any problems understanding the Word of God. So that is a powerful verse that our Father brings forth there. Salvation is wonderful. But make sure that your salvation is true, the true Christ, whereby on that day at the seventh trump, when he appears, you haven't been sucked in by the sixth trump. If you're familiar with Revelation, you won't have any trouble with that. And if you're not, shame on you. That he'll say, get out of my sight. I don't even know you. I never knew you. Verse 12. I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. This is a promise of the gathering back. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. Are you a part of that remnant? That's God's election. I will put them together as the sheep of Basra. Basra meaning fortress, and it's a, a good land. Lots of pasture, lots of truth, lots of food for thought. As the flock in the midst of their fold, they shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of men. What? Because of the happiness. So, yeah, you can listen to the threatening, and you can rise above it if you pay strict attention to verse 7 that we covered. For a man that walk uprightly is going to be all right. 13. The breaker is come up before them. That's the Assyrian. And in Isaiah chapter 14, the Assyrian is one of the names of Antichrist. And when you look to the future sense, that's what we're talking about. He's come up. It's going to be there. They have broken up and have passed through the gate and are gone out by it. And when the Assyrian brought the captivity, they did go out by that gate. They went over the C C Caucasus Mountains and became Caucasians, okay? And their king shall pass before them and the Lord on the head of them. Even our enemy armies God controls. You learned that in the prophet of Je by the prophet of uh, Joel. Chapter 3, verse 1. We've got one more verse of threatening, one more chapter, rather, of threatenings. You ready for it? You might as well be. It's God's Word, and it's part of it. Chapter 4, the blessings for those that adhere to His Word will come forth. Chapter 3, verse 1, and it reads, And I said, Hear, I pray you, O heads of Jacob. That's you that have a little common sense and that think for yourselves. And ye princes of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know judgment? Isn't, isn't it up to you to know right from wrong? I would ask that question, especially of this generation. 
to you or don't you know right from wrong? I guarantee you, we have the, we are born intuitively, we have that knowledge of, hey, this ain't right. Mm -mm. This won't cut it. And when your spiritual self says that to you, that means that you still have a spark of that judgment in you, okay? Got it? Verse 2. Uh, I would insert the word in English, instead, who hate the good and love the evil, who pluck off their skin from off them and their flesh from off their bones. I mean, they fillet them. They fillet my children. I, God himself in another place would say, I gave them the right to chastise my people, the Assyrian, uh, but he filleted them. I mean, he didn't only just clip the wool from them. He took hide hair and all, okay? Don't think that God doesn't notice. And you know, what is really sad is people are not intelligent enough to understand this happens to them. And primarily, the greatest old fish hook there is is usury. I won't give a lecture on that. Verse 3, who also eat the flesh of my people. That's the oppression, okay? And flay, there you go, their skin from off them. And they break their bones and chop them in pieces as for the pot and as flesh within the cauldron, the old cooking pot. Uh, just, just um, let's just render them down and see how much we can really get out of them. Boy, there's some of you that should begin to wake up with as many bankruptcies as we have in this nation today and realize that somewhere behind the scene, you're being rendered down like Lord. You don't have to be that way. You can be successful and have God's blessings. Well, how do I do that? By studying your Father's Word, it's His instructions that tell you how to be successful. Verse 4, Then shall they cry unto the Lord, but He will not hear them. Why should He? He will even hide His face from them at that time, as they have behaved themselves ill in their doings. What, is, what does that mean? listening to a bunch of sputterers. You know when something makes common sense or not. Don't you have any wit of judgment left within you to know what, some, what is right and what is wrong, what is Father's word and what is traditions of men? If not, hey, he won't listen to you. He will not bless you. That's his word, not mine. Verse 5. Thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that make my people err. Who, who, these preachers that make my people do wrong. Well, I've never heard that before. Wake up. That bite with their teeth and cry peace. Do you know what that means? That say those sweet, oozy, dripping things into your ear and then bite it off. Take a nibble out of you as you pull away. And he that putteth not into their mouths, they even prepare war against him. If you won't agree with their little schemes, their little way, their systems, their denominations, if you don't say, give, 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 they'll declare war on you. They'll write bad things about you. If you teach God's word chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and you don't beg like they do, you got trouble, friend. They're going to isolate you and try to say you're just as wrong as you can be. But God's word, remember this, is never wrong. Man may at times teach it wrong, but God's word, when taught properly, is never wrong. Verse 6. Therefore, you might say, I might say to them, or I do say to them, God says, night shall be unto you that you shall not have a vision and it shall be dark unto you that you shall not divine. And the sun shall go down over the prophets, and the day shall be dark over them. 
In other words, those sputterers, the, the end could happen before their very eyes and they could not recognize it. Now, let's use this as an example. What does it mean, the sun go down? Eclipse. They're not smart enough to know night from day, quite frankly. You could, we could, on the first level, teach it that way. But what darkens the sun? The moon, but when it gets between the earth and the sun. Well, uh, when does that happen? It happened two hours ago from the time this live broadcast was made. It happened in our central time zone beginning at the equator, the center of the earth, at 11.40, and by the hour of 12, 12.15, it was over. Meaning, through the 11th hour, went into the 12th. Well, why did God do that? Why does he allow that? What did he put the sun and the moon there for? Have you never read the first chapter of Genesis for signs and for seasons? so that you could discern if you have your eyes open. Well, what possibly could that have meant? Well, let me tell you something that was happening. As that eclipse took place, 1.4 degrees north of the moon was Jupiter. Do you know something else? I mean, this is while this is happening, passing from the 11th to the 12th hour only two degrees from the sun. Reason being, the moon was about to cover the sun, okay? So it's, they're all jammed up. Well, well, what is this Jupiter? It's Zeus. The planet that is symbolic of the god of the heathen world. Well, who would that be? I'll give you one guess. Satan. So when we see the sun and the moon and the planet noted for Zeus, many people get frightened because Zeus is much in the Greek like Jesus, the spelling, and they get all bent out of shape. A little knowledge is a dangerous thing. But what is God telling you? I don't know. Take the words I just spoke and put them together, and I get only one thing from it. We're very close. Well, that just was a big accident. Come on. The, out of the whole universe will be the last eclipse next to the last eclipse. There is one more total. I mean, this was total. It was beautiful. And if you're watching this live, be sure and catch that eclipse on the evening news. It was absolutely beautiful. And the diamond effect would just knock your eyes out when it came to pass. Boy, I'm telling you, I think our father was speaking to us. Read Genesis. I'm sorry. Yes, Genesis chapter 1 concerning the sun and the moon and what they're there for. Well, I'm going to do it for you. I, I, I don't, it isn't that I don't trust you, but uh, uh, let's see here. And he said in verse 15, and then, and let there, them be for light. Oh, see, here, verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons. And for days and years, I don't know, what did you see as a sign and what did you see as a season and what did you see as far as years are concerned with Jupiter being snugged up so close between 1 and, and 0.4 to 2 degrees from both planet, the, the sun and the moon? I don't know. You, you figured, am I saying something's about to happen? No, I'm saying there was a sign. That's what God placed it there. Can we interpret it? Well, the sputters won't be able to. But I, I believe you can. And in as much as we're in, and we know we're already in the generation of the fig tree, I think your father's talking to you all right. There will not be, following one, I believe it's in the coming year, another total eclipse of the sun until the year 2006. So you take it from there. Okay. But the sputters, what he's telling you here, is those sputtering preachers, those chattering, those ooze out, so sweet stuff, but yet they'll bite you in the back when you turn around to walk off if you mess with their money, okay? Why? That's their living. They're hired to do that. 
Hey, I'm just making friends and influencing people here, all right? You know, and um, I, I know this just it thrills the ministry when they really hear God's Word taught as it should be, okay? I mean, that's what the Word said. What he's saying here, your sputters are not going to see that vision or see the sign. I just want to make sure you do. Verse 7. Then shall the seers be ashamed, and the diviners confounded. Yea, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer of God. What did he say? When they try for a vision, I'm not going to answer their prayers. You know, it was, it's, that's an idiom that means when they bite their lip because their mouth is not, their ratchet jaw is not joined because, hey, they just run out of something to say, okay? You've always got word, God's Word to speak, but it's really better. I, every time I think of this, when this idiom of covering their lips, it reminds me of when old Elijah was up against 400 Baal priests, and the Baal priest had this altar built up, and they had the sacrifice upon it, and they'd pile the logs up, and they were praying from early in the morning until late in the afternoon to their God, Baal, to bring fire down from heaven. And old Elijah just sit over on the side, and, hey, maybe he went on vacation. And then later he would say the equivalent, I think I can be, I know I can be correct in this, I'll, I'll just, I'll sweeten it up in English, but what it was in the Hebrew, maybe he took a potty break. Okay. They're God, of course, you know. So the sputters are going to find themselves much in that position. I think our Father has a real sense of humor. I really do. But this is threatening, and you can take it as God's Word, because if you can do any judging at all today, look around you from right from wrong, from getting your life together with an understanding from our Father and being able to see the signs and know who you are and what God expects of you as you see the tumult in this world today. Verse 8. But truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgressions and to Israel his sin. Don't ever be afraid to teach God's Word as it's written well, it might offend. You, you were just talking about the reverence. They're to be reverenced. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. I don't reverence them. Hey, they're good friends and all that, but don't ever call me reverend because I'm not fit to reverence. Only God is to be reverenced. You will never see me write Reverend Murray before my name. That's why I call myself a pastor, and a pastor is nothing but a high-class sheep herder and you're the sheep, and he feeds those sheep, and he makes sure they get their bellies full of truth, not what some oozy, dripping, sweet fig might drop on them. Verse 9, hear this. I pray ye, ye heads of the house of Jacob and princes of the house of Israel, that abhor, that is to say hate, judgment, and pervert all equity, there's no sign of fairness in it. That's the rulers. What do you see among the rulers? Well, ours was George Washington, never lied. Man, we could be proud of him, stood out there in the frost all by himself. All winter long on the lake, ready to do battle to save this nation. What a leader. What do we have today? Well, I won't go into it. Come to think about it, it wouldn't be fair because he was never in the military, was he? George Washington was. Anyway, you know, you know what I mean. Just, just use judgment. Look for yourself. Don't have wool pulled over your eyes. Verse 10. They build up Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. That's deceit, lies. 11. The heads thereof judge for reward. That's for a bribe. And the priest, that's your sputters, your preachers, thereof teach for hire, not gifted from God, but for money. And the prophets thereof divine for money. Yet will they learn, lean upon the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. Just believe and it's there. 
I, I can preach and prophesy and the message that if you say it's going to be, it's going to be. I could, will divine you up something that doesn't exist. Oh, no. Now, what does God's Word say about that? He says, you do your work and I, then I'll add those things onto you. All right? Well, if something's wrong somewhere, isn't it? I'm divining for money today. If you send in, you can't outgive God. You know, just give everything you've got and don't worry, God will replace it. No, if you're stupid enough to give everything you've got to some sputter, you think for one moment God's even going to bless you because you're giving aid to a sputterer? I don't think so. Now, again, I'm just making friends with the hirelings here. I'm uh, in winning popularity contest all over the country with our father. And that's all that counts with me, but it pleases a lot of the good reverends also. Hey, can't you tell right from wrong? Are you intelligent? Can you see what's happening? That's what your father is asking you. Verse 12 to complete the chapter, and that's all the threatenings. And then we can be sweet next lecture. 12, therefore to everyone, maybe even the sputterers. Verse 12, therefore shall Zion for your sake be plowed as a field. Why? Because of them, the sputters. And Jerusalem shall become heaps, not one stone left atop another. And the mountain of the house as the high places of the forest. Jesus said, not one stone left. When it's all said and done and after Antichrist hits there, what's the sign? What's the season? Well, uh, you determine because I think you have enough knowledge that you can judge right from wrong. And I think you have enough knowledge to know when God is speaking to you. Intuitively, you should know. You better watch the signs. You better keep your head out of the sand. And the, I, do I owe apologies to anyone? Not when I can speak with a flower that a beautiful girl bought, brought me all the way from Iowa, you know? To bring such a sweet message to the, to the, um, to those that work so dip, uh, hard uh, in the church houses of this nation, because to the good reverends, and there are some, then they understand what I'm saying. So don't any of you accuse me of being hard on good men of God. Because a false preacher and a sputter is not a friend of mine, nor are they a friend of God. They need to be offended by hearing the truth. Then they will know to be ashamed and change their ways and become a teacher of God's word for which they claim to be. Okay. Good message in the next lecture is called restoration. Don't miss it. All right. Bless your heart. You listen a moment. Won't you please?